Um, I think it requires a degree more of nuance. I wouldn't say that they have um, an infinite amount of influence, uh, and I think somewhere in between, in the middle, uh, there's an answer. And I think that's that in each country there's a set of dynamics uh, that, yes, as Elizabeth said, uh, are different. Uh, and for that reason, you find uh, very different um, levers and um, mechanisms and points of entry uh, for external actors. So in some countries, uh, you could almost argue that there is a complete and entire loss of sovereignty. Uh, in others, um, you could say that, in fact, you know, that country is autonomous and is able to, um, or relatively autonomous, and is able to decide to a certain degree how it, its uh, course of uh, future will go on. But this will really bring me back into the points that I um, would like to discuss, and I think it's, it's nuance here is the main issue. Um, if anything is characterizing the Arab Spring so far, three and, well, three, three and a half years later, it's this need for nuance, and I don't think that we um, have completely understood um, or even debunked some of the previous myths that have been uh, lurking and lingering for so many decades, uh, but also that we introduced uh, new myths into this um, very interesting period. I mean, the first is that it was a spring, um, and we know that now that this could actually be the Arab decade, if not the Arab century. It's, it's still really too early to tell, but what we do know for certain is that uh, on the eve of the fall of, of so many dictators in North Africa, um, those countries look far from utopia, look far more dystopian in nature and in future. So what does it say about the aspirations of millions of people um, that supposedly took to the streets? Well, it does question the other um, springs that we've had uh, in the past, particularly in Europe. Um, one looks at 89 and 90 and looks at the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, and to see what was offered, and it wasn't just the you know, the falling of bricks and the falling of a wall that was, that was effectively the sign of a future. It was, you know, economic trade and, and pact and the offer of, uh, of something better, an offer of a different ideology. If we look at Tunisia, for example, uh, a country that has attempted free market liberalism and, and, and you know, to a certain degree um, felt left out by that, what were they being offered? And if one asks what the EU could possibly offer... Well, in very frank terms, the EU counts its aid effectively, or in real effect, in millions, and the Arab states in billions, particularly Tunisia, and in that case, Egypt as well. Now, the only actors that can give billions are GCC countries. So effectively, from day one, we should have already known how this was going to play out if we're asking about external actors, external forces. Having said that, the approach towards uh, North Africa particularly, which is the area that I would like to concentrate on, um, what were the older forms of engagement? I mean, what were the issues that were central to the forms of engagement between, say, the EU and the Western world at large and North Africa? You know, security, stability, to a certain degree, when you move towards Egypt, that question becomes a question of Israel. Uh, but ultimately, it was dictated by, let's have a repressive stability, um, you know, feel free to use counterterrorism at any moment in time to justify uh, securitizing things. But mainly that's in case of human trafficking um, and to a certain degree drugs control, but human trafficking is probably the most uh, important issue. Three and a half years later, have those issues gone? No, not at all. They're still there. The issues that are now facing engagement with North Africa in the Arab Spring are very much the same. The nuance and difference is the stakeholder map is looking very, very different. So one can look at two significant moments. One can look at the rise of Islamist groups in North Africa uh, with Nahda in, in Tunisia and uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And then to a certain degree, Libya obfuscates any kind of real determinant ground as to who the actors were, what their ideological strands were, um, but we can mildly say that Libya was a mix of both, um, and I'll come on to that in a moment. But these new stakeholders um, were a process of democratization, uh, and in some cases, mainly in the Tunisian case, have left through a process of democratization. But let's not try to be too naive here. New stakeholders have emerged. Um, that's not to say that they weren't stakeholders before, 
But to say new means that they've shifted from being political consumers to being political agents of change. And in that respect, I would identify tribes in Libya, I would identify civil society in Egypt and in Tunisia. You could also identify religious groups, social movements. Um, but central to this has been the way in which, as consumers beforehand, um, these were still people, they still had informal ways and informal structures of power, uh, or they were informal structures, but now they're informal structures of power. Um, and that's really added a degree of weight. Now, I don't want to cut to any kind of policy prescription, but I want to highlight a point here. As they're informal structures of power, and they consume or were consumers beforehand, these are structures that are attaining or attempting to make grabs of power, and could have been engaged to by or could have been engaged with. Uh, by the EU and by the Western world at large, um, through limited funding, uh, through limited forms of engagement, anything from B2B to you know, working along nascent civil society groups, which has been the case. But we've also seen how these groups have been co-opted, and that brings me uh, very easily onto the point of Egypt. And this is the point about trying to debunk a myth, and the same, very same case for Tunisia, and the very same case for Libya. This notion that there is a... that the, the people the Arab street, they took the streets, they took, they own the streets. I mean, you can call me uh, a cynic, um, and I don't mind being called a cynic, um, but nothing could be further from the truth. This notion that there are, you know, 60 million people in the streets of Egypt, that we have 20 million somehow in the streets of Libya, we're only a population of about four and a half, five million people. Uh, Tunisia has the same thing. Numbers, a numbers game is interesting, and it's never been about a numbers game. It was a moral Story, And it was always a moral story because of the way in which Mohammed Bouazizi he didn't ask millions of people to join him in the streets uh, at the beginning of the Jasmine Revolution, is what we called it. He took to the street and burnt himself because he was feeling undignified. And he, generally, people felt a sense of empathy with him. But to talk about millions on the streets almost infers this notion that it's a numbers game. And if it's a numbers game, and we look at parliamentary and electoral democracy, then it begins to really confuse the situation when we speak about, well, you know, what is legitimate forms of violence, what are legitimate forms of protest, what are legitimate structures of power. And it's at this point where the informal structures of power are very interesting because they are, to a certain degree, not irrelevant because there's a myth of the people, they're still very relevant. But to think of them as cohesive, to think of them as, you know, one man raises his hand and 60 million people go outside, this is a myth. To think that they all somehow agree with one another and there's no pluralism in the Arab world or North Africa is even more insulting, I find. And so in that respect, this notion that 50 million took to the streets in Egypt, you know, was complete tosh, and everybody knows that it's complete tosh. If you want to, you know, believe that, then we do so at our own peril. Um, but the problem is, is that somehow that led to change. Now, when we look at the Egyptian dynamics, we can see quite firmly that one asking to re, you know, for a revolution to change the state is a very, very difficult question because these new stakeholders are not alone in the field, whether in Libya, Tunisia, uh, and in Egypt, but also when we go towards Syria, there is still the deep state, and that is you know, uh, deeper business interests, the media, um, and then obviously when we come towards Egypt and a lot of the Arab world, we have this old Askeri model that we've imported from Turkey so many years ago, this old model of really the state is in fact the armed forces, and the armed forces are in fact the state. Uh, trying to you know, differentiate between them is almost impossible. So in that respect, where do we go? Where do we reform the Egyptian state without asking the army to reform itself? Well, that's a very difficult question. I don't really have many answers here. But the challenge is definitely there for all to see. One can definitely see at the beginning of uh, 2011 a significant move by the army in, in Egypt, um, and that hasn't changed much. Now, there could have been significant engagement through the EU. Um, Baroness Ashton has already you know, been there several times, but does not enjoy the same kind of leverage that she perhaps does in, in Tunisia. Uh, and the real question is, then, who enjoys leverage there? And this comes back to the point that Elizabeth was making earlier on, and the question that I was asked at the beginning of this. Do external forces and external actors have influence? The short answer is yes, and they have a lot of influence. And particularly when we look at Egypt, you can see how Saudi Arabia and, and, uh, and the UAE have a significant amount of influence in the way in which that game changes. Now, obviously with the army, um, private business interests there 
significant. One can also look at the media, and a very good example here is um, the uh, satire show uh, Basim Yusuf al Barnamij, uh, an excellent show that captured the minds of millions across the Arab world. Um, everybody was almost tuning in on a Thursday, Friday evening to watch this show. Um, and under the rule of Mohammed Morsi, um, became ex extremely popular for his ability to find comedy and dissent in the very same breath. Um, you know, the fall of the Muslim Brotherhood on June 30th of last year was met with celebration by Basim Yusuf and you know, heralding a new form of democracy. Didn't last another six, seven months before he was off the air because of Abd al-Fatah Sisi. And now people start to ask themselves, well, what, what really happened? And then the deeper question is, you know, looking at informal stakeholders, civil society, you know, we talk about civil society in the Arab world as though there's a full stop at the end of that question or at the end of that name, when in fact it's really a comma. They haven't really stopped evolving. We don't really know if civil society exists and we don't know how civil that part of civil society really is. A, good, a great question in, in answer is as both movements in Libya and in Egypt, uh, the Tamarad movements, which sincerely masquerade as civil society movements, but in fact are social doctrinal movements in the very same way the Muslim Brotherhood is a social doctrinal movement that became a political party. In that same way, to talk about millions of people and to say we the people deserve change um, and then to sign up to the army's policy of change in two countries significantly within a year and to masquerade as civil society whilst being backed by either the army or millions of dollars coming from the Gulf uh, is an insult to all the other civil society organizations there as well. Now, I don't want to get into a game of, of calling, you know, one being insulted and there's a, a great, you know, innocent movement there that is uh, somewhere in the shadows. I'm not advocating for anybody to support anybody, but one can definitely see a picture emerging of how internal factors and, and uh, you know, internal positive, uh, well, you would call them positive agents of change, but they are agents of change, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, but they are there and they are funded by you know, very, very different movements. And the GCC in that respect has so much to offer them. When we come down to Libya and we come down to the way in which we engage with Libya and Egypt and Tunisia to a certain degree, but Libya mainly, we see what Elizabeth was mentioning earlier on about the proxy war. Now, Egypt's a, sorry, Libya is a great example of how, yes, Cold War to a certain degree, proxy war to a certain degree, um, but only two months ago, that is now what I would consider direct involvement, the latest bombing um, and aerial bombardment of Libya um, by jets from the UAE, either co-piloted by Egyptians or uh, allowed through Egyptian um, airspace, most certainly through coordination with the Egyptian armed forces, that constitutes direct involvement, that's not a proxy war. Uh, and so that signifies and definitely typifies change and a change in currents. Now, in Libya in 2011, the UAE and Qatar did fly sorties over Libya. Um, I think the UAE actually crash-landed their first flight, uh, and Qatar, I think, had really mainly refueled a lot of the flights, but they really hadn't done much apart from flexing their muscles. This latest bombardment is significant, and it would show to a certain degree that they are speaking to their neighbors in the Persian Gulf, but also that they can show that North Africa is also their terrain. They can also be an influential actor in North Africa as well. Um, but that would definitely signify change. Now, I'll wrap up my final comments by asking what for the future. And in North Africa, I, I would say the future looks quite bleak. We did see the return of uh, autocracy in Egypt. It looks increasingly likely that, Egypt, that Libya was making moves and, and, and striding towards the very same fate. Um, but effectively, um, the deputy head of the Tripoli Council in Libya, when I interviewed him, and I asked him about the two conflicting movements in Libya, Operation Dignity by Colonel Khalifa Haftar, who is effectively a cheap man, Sisi, and the Muslim Brotherhood-led uh, Operation Dawn. Uh, and when asked what happened with Operation Dawn, the fall of the, the, the recent activities in Tripoli, um, Khalifa Haftar's attempt to try to take hold of the capital um, his answer, uh, Hashim, uh, Hashim Krekshi, uh, said, well, the Muslim Brotherhood had uh, Haftar for lunch before they could have him for dinner. And effectively, that was the case. I mean, you know, I interviewed um, senior Muslim Brotherhood leaders at the end of last year for a, a book I was co-authoring and trying to understand what they wanted for the future. 
you know, what their political aims were. Do they abide by the rule of law? Are they interested in civic participation and freedom of thought and pluralism? Um, and all that went aside. I mean, they were not interested in any of these questions because they said on the eve of what happened in June 30th, they are now facing an existential crisis. They now feel that um, the return of Arab autocracy is the greatest single problem and threat towards them and that they have to dig their feet in. Now, to give you context, that's the very same time, the very same month I was interviewing them as there were elections for the Constituent Assembly to draft the constitution in Libya. Many of their own candidates had pretty much left or had not been interested in standing for the elections and are now you know, moving from electoral democracy and trying to go back to either being a paramilitary group or at least arming themselves to the teeth so that they couldn't be swallowed up in you know, a la Sisi. And so in that respect, what does it offer in the future? We had groups that were going from social doctrinal movements uh, and almost civil society without a civil society, moving into political parties, but then within less than three years have regressed back into what they weren't even for the last 30 years. You know, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt has not been a paramilitary organization since 1981 uh, and had renounced violence uh, in 1981. So in that respect, it's almost a return to the past. It's a very interesting kind of moment for the Arab world, but it, it poses much more questions than it gives answers. One thing's for sure is that we definitely have you know, a new challenge between these new stakeholders and the deep state. It's going to be a very, very difficult question to see who wins. If, it was a, if I was a betting man, and I'm not, and even though we're staying next to a casino, I probably wouldn't want to bet it, but if I was pushed, I would say that the older, more uh, entrenched interests within the state, those being the deep, uh, deep, deep business interests and the army, for example, in Egypt, when it comes to Libya, again, media moguls, businessmen, shadowy figures from the old remnants of the regime, it seems that they um, have an incredible amount of power that they still wield, uh, financial resources and military assets are still in their control. Uh, and in that respect, yes, I mean, in Libya they may not have a monopoly on power. In Egypt they certainly do. Um, but you look at the region today and ask yourself, in 2011, what, what did it look like? In 2014, it's a very, it's a very nasty picture and a very nasty image. Uh, and so in that respect, I would say my cautionary optimism that I had and I shared with Edward Solar last year on, on my panel in Paris um, is definitely a lot more cautionary. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much.